Take a look at this example of a crew practicing CPR. The simulation training made as realistic as possible sets the stage for mastery of skills. Consider what you might do differently while watching this scenario. How would you debrief the team afterwards? Team practice is essential to perfecting the choreography of resuscitation. Some call this pit crew CPR, likening the roles and function of the resuscitation to a race car pit crew. Whether the team consists of two people or 20, the resuscitation works best when everyone has predetermined roles. Depending on resources, one person may need to cover more than one role. Ideally, there would be two compressors, each rotating every two minutes and concentrating on adequate rate, depth, and recoil. There would be one or two people on the airway, there would be a team leader, a recorder, and somebody to watch the monitor. There would even be a person that would be dedicated to interacting and speaking with the family and updating them as the resuscitation goes on. Having defined roles, adequate workspace, performing rapid assessment, and performing high performance CPR is imperative to improving outcomes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Fran, are you tired? I got it. Are you sure? I'm okay. All right, let's just take a time out for just a second. One of the most important things that we do here is that we need to be able to apply excellent, good quality, uninterrupted compressions. That's gonna increase our chance for optimal patient outcome. Training scenarios should include optimal compressor rotation. Ideally, the compressor should be rotated every two minutes. One of the ways that we can effectively do this is a concept called pit crew CPR. And essentially when we do this, we're gonna have an individual that's assigned every task that we need to do, and that's gonna be predetermined. There is no single right way to resuscitate a patient, but regular practice and reflection on performance can hone each person's role on the pit crew team. Preparing for complications ahead of time so they can be efficiently addressed increases the chance of a favorable patient outcome. If the patient vomits, we already know that the person who's doing the compressions is gonna be the one to roll the patient onto the side. Whether we have two people or whether we have 20 people, we're gonna to try to optimize each of the components of providing care so that it can be done as seamlessly and as efficiently as possible. One, two, three. I'm going to start an IV line. And can we switch to this monitor, please? Uh, your sister is in cardiac arrest. We're working on her right now, okay? We'll be with you in just a couple minutes. We were just on our way to the doctor. What's going on? What's wrong with her? One, two, three. Family presence during resuscitation is dependent on the situation. If a family member desires to be present and there is someone knowledgeable about the resuscitation who can be dedicated to being with that family member and explaining what is happening, that may confer positive psychological benefits for the family member. If this is going to be done, make sure that your team knows that family is present. Okay, we just started an intravenous line right now. Okay, Ivy, very good. Yeah. All right, let's... 
Yeah. First line compression is great. Hard and fast, so allow me to leak the oil. I have a BOS airway in the nasal and oral. Mm -hmm. I'm administering one milligram epinephrine for your IV. Okay. Administered. One, two, three, yes. four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 30, 14, 15, good 15, pulses 15, with CPR. 18, Thank you. 19, After this round, let's do a rhythm 20, check. 20, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Okay. Let's prepare to uh, shock. Okay. So everyone clear the patient. Keep the or compressions going. Keep compressions going while we charge. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Okay. 15, Keep going. 18, all right, everyone clear the patient. We're going to shock. Everyone clear. Good. Continue compressions. Thank you so much. Okay. Yes, we are. Mr. Administering 300 milligrams and the other arm through the IV. No past medical history. Okay. For a couple of uh, days. Uh, no medication, no allergies. Okay. No meds, no allergies, no pet medicine. And uh, when you get a second, do you mind asking when she was last seen well? Good chest rise with the breasts. 10, 11, 12. 14, 15, 16, 17, Let's get that uh, second heavy ready to go. Uh, you're not administering, you're ready to go. 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. Do you have good compliance bagging? 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, okay. 27, 28, 29, 30. Okay, let's look at the rhythm. Okay, rhythm check. We're still on the V-fib. Okay, let's get on the chest. Get back on the chest. Chest compression, please. Let's charge the defibrillator. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, continue compressions. I'll be charged. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay, we're charged. Everyone clear? Clear. Okay, shocking. Start compressions. Continue. One, All right, let's go ahead with that. Three, four, 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 what we say, and how we say the things that we do. Additionally, body language is really important. Nonverbal messages can say far more than the actual words we use. We have to keep all of these ideas in mind and be really honest with family members. So here's four things to think of. Be prepared. Anticipate what the family may ask, any questions that they may have about treatments, therapies, what we're doing, why, why we're not leaving the scene right away, and how we can tell them in a perspective that they would understand. We have to walk in their shoes a little bit during this experience. Inform them. Introduce yourself, find out who they are, how they know the family member, and then we can ask some other questions that are really pertinent and important. So the OPQRST questions and the sample questions, pertinent positives and negatives as well. Be supportive. Reassure them, answer all their questions with honesty, and communicate every step of the way. Finally, debrief. This may happen at the scene, and it may also happen at the hospital. Again, answer their questions, and be very open and honest. All these things can be tremendously helpful when interacting with family members at the scene of a cardiac arrest. Key takeaways for communicating with family members during and after critical patient care. Be prepared, be informative, be supportive, be sincere. Thank you so much for joining us on this simulation training exercise video. 
Pit crew CPR is something that we speak a lot about. In fact, it's a term that's become popularized in EMS culture, but the path to pit crew CPR is fraught with challenges. And designing and implementing a system where we are actually improving and optimizing cardiac arrest outcomes is not easy. It's really important to study this in advance and understand what everybody's role is and approach it from a team aspect to ensure that we deliver high quality compressions and the delivery of care. I think in the scenario where every second counts, we have to be deliberate in regards to our own practice and value the role of simulation training. And indeed, one of the things I advocate for most is interagency training. So for example, you might live in a community where a volunteer BLS squad is dispatched to a cardiac arrest, a private ALS squad is dispatched to a cardiac arrest, and your local fire brigade is also dispatched to a cardiac arrest. We could also have bystander CPR as well as a police officer trained in CPR who arrives prior to us. Absolutely. Yet nevertheless, how often are these various agencies training together so that when they do have a critically ill or injured patient, they can come together, know each other's roles, and really seamlessly integrate to deliver high quality care. It's very important for the first arriving EMS providers to get that process organized early on to take that role. Whether you're an EMT that's first on scene, a uh, highly skilled and trained ALS provider, or even if you are a dispatcher who is talking to a distraught family member, giving those recommendations over the phone to initiate bystander CPR can be incredibly important. That really is a critical component of, of early CPR in public recognition. When we talk about actually delivering high quality compressions, we emphasize push hard, push fast, and allow for a complete chest recoil. Recoil is one of those areas that's incredibly challenging to teach because folks don't really understand the physiology of recoil. It is a critical component as we do high quality CPR. I think when we are performing compressions, we can very easily understand that compressions cause blood to flow out of the left ventricle. But the importance of recoil is actually to generate negative intrathoracic pressure. And that might sound like a complex phrase, but really all that is is preload. In other words, by allowing your hands to leave the patient's chest wall, you're actually causing blood to return to the heart, fill the rights of the heart, so that when you are performing compressions, you actually have a full chamber that you can use to help start getting cardiac flow. It's so important to get that blood flow and fill those chambers of the heart. Now, in regards to all the various roles that are necessary in pit crew CPR, you need to have a team leader. You need to have someone who's gonna manage the entire scene for you. And then in regards to if you're the first two providers on scene, taking charge of the airway, as well as taking charge of high quality CPR. It's important to get that, those compressions started immediately and do them effectively. And I know we've all come a long way from I'm clear, you're clear, we're all clear pre-charging your AED or pre-charging your defibrillator and really focusing on minimizing interruptions during your peri-shock pause is absolutely critical to achieving good outcomes. It requires a lot of practice to learn to watch your monitor and then get the order to charge it while still doing compressions. And we all feel reassured when we're ultimately able to palpate a pulse and know that we have achieved return of spontaneous circulation. But in modern times, we should really be using end tidal CO2 if and when ALS providers are on scene, otherwise immediately resuming high quality CPR. Well, it's so important to get on, on the chest doing compressions immediately after the defibrillation, even when we do have positive results from end tidal CO2. We've got to build that pressure back up in the system before we can allow the, the heart to take over by itself. Hovering over the chest while the shock is delivered is absolutely vital. And that's also a good opportunity to switch compressors if you need to as well. 
feedback devices are becoming increasingly common both on the BLS and ALS spectrum. And if your service employs one of those devices, we strongly recommend implementing it because it does give you immediate objective feedback on the quality of compressions. Oftentimes there's just so much occurring out of cardiac arrest that that machine will give us the feedback necessary to ensure that we're delivering high quality compressions. Ultimately designing a system in the pre-hospital setting that optimizes your cardiac arrest outcomes is challenging, but nevertheless, it is a fruitful task that we can certainly engage in. And BLS providers in regards to cardiac arrest response are integral in the chain of survival. It's so important to have good, high quality compressions and our BLS providers are well-trained at doing that for us. The techniques described in this video are included to spark discussion, not as authoritative practice directives. Consider the benefits and limitations of each technique and discuss with your colleagues and medical director. The content is intended as an educational resource only and not intended to supersede any state, regional, or local guidelines, protocols, policies, 